Let's talk about BDSM and meditation. Hey everyone, welcome back to my channel. My name is Brittany Simon. Oh yeah, let's go. In today's video, we are working with Hoi. Hi Priestess. You guys know I love this company. It's the only company that I'm currently working with. I love them. I thank them for sponsoring this video. It's such an important video to me and I'm so excited to jump in. Excuse the labored breathing. You know me, a girl having some uh, chronic fatigue moments. So <laughs> we're gonna ignore the heavy labored breathing and go right into today's video about meditation and BDSM. I think the most important part about meditation is in my opinion, truly, there are so many ways to do it that you really need to do the homework and figuring out what works for you. Sometimes it's not even something that's been written down. Example, in Middle Eastern culture, I'm Chaldean, my parents are from Iraq, we drink a lot of tea. I asked my dad one time, I said, why do you drink so much tea? And he said, well, first it keeps you cool, even in the hot Iraqi sun, but also it's a moment of slowness. You take a sip, you feel it like enter your system, the warmth, the texture, it really calms the, the soul. And um, in a like Arab culture, Middle Eastern culture, you'll see a lot of men, they hold these beads. They're sort of like, I call them meditation beads. Some people call them stress beads, but they hold these beads, these beautiful, you know, kind of things you can fumble with, almost like a fidget spinner for Middle Eastern people, I guess. But like a lot of my uncles and grandfathers, like they would hold this bead and they would just play with it as they spoke, something to do with their hands, which is so funny because a part of me is like, man, I need me a bead set. So to kind of combine the ideas of tea, my background, and this current sponsor with a high priestess. There's actually a tea in this box. I've got a little pamphlet here with, you know, what's in the box. And this tea right here was featured. This is a red clover tea. So the theme for this month's box was the Celtics. So this is a Celtic tea. It's a red clover. Uh, I'm sorry. It says red clover is a plant with a lot of significance to the Celts. It has a triple leaf style and the Celts associated this with a triple goddess and life, birth, and death. Interesting. So the triple goddess and life, birth, and death. Interesting. It's a warming and healing tea that can be enjoyed without any sweeteners. This tea comes to us from our friends of Avalon Whole Foods, a wonderful Australian provider of herbal teas. So like everything in the box is manufactured and curated um, from like what I call local businesses, meaning small, growing, organic businesses. I think that's really, really amazing actually. So here we go. So I've got my tea already poured. Okay, this is unsweetened. Okay, you guys know I'm loving the earthy teas. I prefer them over like the herbal teas. Um, though I love herbal tea, you know a girl will drink. But there's something about earthy teas, teas that almost taste to me, um, not to be such an earth sign, but like I really like things that come from the earth, dirt, soil, even the smell of living plants in my house. It really reassures me that I'm okay. Um, so this is just really beautiful actually. Yeah, it's totally what I wanted. Okay, perfect. So I'm going to move the teapot over a little bit. I have everything laid out really pretty. I have like a little a little display of all the items to my left from the box, from the high priestess box. But also, you know, I was instructed to make like an altar. And so I've been really contemplating on a space in my house where I can create an altar. So I'll feature that in another podcast. You guys know I'm really atheistic, but I'm also agnostic. I'm also not woo woo, but I also am woo woo. I'm the kind of person that is very, like I'm really cynical and I like to be grounded in my beliefs. But even so, I enjoy utilizing what can be imaginative what can be sort of a fantasy and utilizing it for fulfillment and reaching my goals. So BDSM is a sort of LARPing lifestyle, but it's also very serious for a lot of people. When I was in that bubble, in the BDSM bubble, when I was literally at events all the time, being a part of the educational programs, trying to be sort of a member of the culture, I really felt important, needed, and grounded. I used BDSM often as a way to know myself and my partners, and I utilized it normally outside the, the boundaries of sex. So like it wasn't really within the context of sex. It wasn't sexual. It was meant for focused, purposeful um, meditation or and or you can think about it as an exploration into self. So meditation is a weird word word for me. You can imagine the Zendel like Patrick Giff or the Zendel guru in the mountains or the monk or the people who don't speak like the nuns who do silent retreats. I think about all those people when I think of uh, you know, actualization, meditation, 
But I don't always think of them when I think of the different journeys you can go on with meditation and awakening or introspection or enlightenment or any word you want to use. Every person feels who's on this particular journey, utilizing particular tools like meditation tools. We know we're seeking something different and usually outside the self, but within the realms of the ego. The ego is such a weird idea. So BDSM allowed me to explore the ego in a safe, sane, and consensual way. In BDSM, we have two modes of sayings. We have safe, sane, consensual and risk aware kink both are amazing utilizations of communication tools to harbor good energy throughout a scene a scene is a time and space with a beginning and an end usually between one two or many people who are exchanging energy that power exchange you hear about is an extension of exchanging energy you can have a power dynamic in which you have a master and a slave a power dynamic in which you have a daddy dom and a little a power dynamic where you have a basic sub and dominant but no matter how you're playing, top or bottom or switch, you you are having an exchange. The kind of exchange can be different. You can have an egalitarian switchy exchange, right? No matter how you're exploring this, no matter the energy you want to exchange, there is a difference between power exchange and energy exchange. So often when you're going about your day in the grocery stores or the bank and you're talking to people, there's not really like a top and bottom energy being exchanged, though you could argue that a bank teller who's holding your money might have more of a power imbalance uh, in their favor when dealing with you. Depending on how the interactions are going though, let's say you're just going about your day and you're talking to another person at Stater Brothers, you're in the grocery store and you're both talking about macaroni and cheese. There's definitely an energy exchange happening. There's a warmness maybe being exchanged, a familiarity, a, oh, are we buying the same groceries? And oh, it's like we're having a moment together. But there's not really a power dynamic. There's not really a power exchange because nobody's willingly giving up their power in that moment to have discourse, to have a conversation. So that's not really the same thing as like a power exchange in BDSM, but it could be the same thing as a sharing of energy that you would find in meditative practices or spiritual practices or religious belief systems. So for me as a BDSMer and a person who uh, is very imaginative and plays with her energy and meditates and believes in meditation, though doesn't believe in a literal God or anything of that nature, it puts me in a conundrum, a situation where I constantly have to explain myself. Oh my gosh, I'm BDSM, but I'm not BDSM the way I used to be BDSM. Like when I explore BDSM, it's for meditative purposes with a focus in mind years ago, probably two or three years ago, so not quite years ago. On my Patreon, I had made a masochistic meditation video. I like masochism. I like pain. I think pain, i.e. suffering, moves things forward. I think I'm stronger because of my suffering, but I also believe you cannot purposely cause pain or suffering and have it be the lesson you want it to be. So I don't think I could just go into an alleyway and stab myself in the arm and be like, I'm going to meditate and understand myself in a spiritual way. And this is how I do it through masochistic BDSM, stabbing my own arm. It has to be thought about. It has to be contemplated. There has to be a ritual involved. Ritual is really key to signifying when something is impulsive and manic and when something is thought out and respected. So BDSM is very ritualistic, or at least in my opinion, I think it should be, quote unquote. I don't want to control people. So you know I don't really think you should do BDSM in a particular way, but I do think that if you're focused on the meditative practices of BDSM, then you should have a ritual to help uh, make it a better experience. So things like the witch box from High Priestess is a way to utilize a tool that you can gather and that you know each product has been touched by human hands there's a candle actually going right now to my left and the candle was handmade it smells really good I actually really love it and it's one of those like treasure candles so there's like crystals inside of it I'm very excited to dig them out of the wax but either which way right for religious people spiritual people yoga people people who do BDSM ritual consistency is really important they actually have done major studies on why people with religions live longer happier lives and it's literally that consistency structure and community the thing we're always striving for that moves us forward that is integrated into our DNA and it shows in our life our cultural bubbles each have rituals they believe in magic what's so different from a witch and a catholic what is so different from an evangelical and a witch when you know when Harry Potter came out, y'all took that very seriously. So people are out here in belief systems in which witches are being taken seriously and or you can still be a visitor into a bubble and experience it. I'll give you an example. 
So you guys know I am in the woo woo, but I'm not like woo woo like my homies are. Some of my girls will call me and they'll be like, have you checked your cards today? And I'm like, no. And they're like, did you check your charts? And I'm like, no. And they're very involved. It, it's utilized throughout their whole existence. That's fine. That's beautiful. That's what we want. An exploration tool that works for the individual. But for me, it's a little overwhelming and I get overstimulated. I prefer magic and woo-woo-ness to be something I play imaginative with, play imagination with. So when I do BDSM, it's the same. It's imagination with something that is scientifically happening and is important. So in the moments in which I am getting these endorphins and I'm these chemicals are being exchanged between me and another person, I'm getting every biological positive reinforcement that I should keep doing this. I'm physically stimulated, I'm adrenaline stimulated, I'm sexually stimulated even though I'm not being sexual. My body is rewarding itself by positive like uh, reactions, <laughs> if you will, because I'm very allosexual, I'm very high sex drive. For me, my body being turned on is just an indicator that I also feel like this is good energy even if sex isn't involved. So when I say sex isn't involved in my BDSM, I mean to say that I don't do BDSM for the purpose of orgasm nor do I traditionally involve genitalia at all. You might be able to utilize the breasts for sort of like candle wax on the boobs or cupping. Fire cupping is something that's really really cool and does you does and is utilized in sensual BDSM masochistic BDSM, meditative BDSM. So it is available to you in in that bubble of BDSM, not just in massage parlors and not in just like yoga circles, okay? Or or hippie circles or or whatever circles have cupping. But you know what I mean. So when I'm utilizing these tools, I'm doing it and curating it for me the individual. I'm very like masculine energy encompassing while presenting very feminine but I in this high priestess box really felt drawn so this one right here is absolutely my favorite this is uh Morgan and Morgan goddess of life and death wielder of the axe and sword I call upon you to bless me with strength and courage it says I ask for your guidance as I set forth to claim what is mine Morgan hear me now this is really interesting to me this idea this you know um to evoke this sort of energy into my life is very interesting I do believe in it in the same way that my mother believes like in saint cards so I have a lot of saint saint catholic things around my house so I have a lot of saint cards and mother mary statues and the infinite Prague. same thing to me when I'm utilizing tools from other spiritual groups I'm utilizing a tool that has worked for them and since I'm a believer in ritual BDSM can be incorporated with things like this where I'm doing a scene and I'm thinking about um, maybe it's a solo scene Let's say it's a meditative solo scene. And I'm thinking, how can I create an environment that is really the energy I want? Sometimes I'll negotiate with people in BDSM. Let's say I have a top. I have this top who's, um, he's fabulous, like wonderful. Like I couldn't say better things about him. And he's someone that when I first met him, it was my birthday party who many, who many, many years ago. Who knows? We were in our 20s. Um, maybe he was 30 by then. I don't remember. We're not too far in age. So anyways, we're sitting there. Um, I have my arms tied up to a hard point on the ceiling and I'm standing and I think I'm maybe I'm just in underwear. I might be topless and a whole bunch of my friends are there, maybe 15 of us or so, and I am being beaten one by one. People are coming up to try to uh, overwhelm me, if you will. I'm a heavy masochist. So the first girl comes up and I kick her right into a wall because, you know, I got my legs. I got my sturdy ass legs. Another person attempts. It's pretty good. I survive. The third guy I had never had a conversation with this man. And normally I vet my play partners very, very like meticulously. But he was vetted through a friend because I was friends with my other top is his partner. So he was a new partner to them. And when he came in, we had pre-negotiated very lightly to have the scene happen. But he and I had never had a scene for like a real scene before this. So this was definitely an exception to the rule. And he came, he looked at me nerdy white guy yo just a nerdy white guy puts on these black gloves and goes like this and just runs at me and I felt like in that moment so centered so focused on just our energies our existences I call him my American psycho because even though he is literally nothing like American psycho he has this energy that he switches into that when poured into a partner, just like it gets you so excited if you're an adrenaline junkie like me. So he comes at me, he's wailing, I'm moving, I'm kicking. I'm like trying to do all these maneuvers with no hands because my arms are tied to the ceiling or, you know, on a, on a rope from a hard point. And I'm swinging and I'm swinging and I, I know I'm going to lose. Like I just know 
but it wasn't just his like physical actions that were overwhelming if you've ever done kickboxing or regular boxing or any kind of working out you know sometimes your adrenaline makes you keep going I could have kept going I had the adrenaline I didn't have the mental uh, adrenaline. I just knew, I knew he was gonna beat me. And so a part of me in that moment gave in to his energy because it was appropriate to, because he had kind of earned it. You know, I had already topped two people before him. I had already been able to outbest the other two before him. But the third came in. And I think when you meet people in those moments, that energy exchange, that's what BDSM is. BDSM is creating such a specific energy, either through ritual or whatever else, that when you meet someone in the right circumstance, it allows for an exploration of energy that just couldn't be explored before. So when I think about why I like BDSM, it's always for the meditation reasons, always for that spiritual connection, always for that being seen. You know how humans wanna love and be loved and they wanna be seen, be seen? Whoa, BDSM is definitely a tool for that, but only if it speaks to you. Just like a witch box, just like tarot, just like astrology, just like Catholicism, if it speaks to you, then maybe it's a tool for you. But if it doesn't speak to you, then maybe it was just a moment in your 20s that you get to tell people about at parties. So now, with all of that said, let's talk about some of the questions I got on Discord. I'm looking at my notes right here. So on Discord, we had discussed BDSM and the differences between tops, bottoms, and submissives and so on. So just really fast for those who need to know. So in BDSM, and because I'm queer, this is gonna be confusing, but I think necessary to talk about. So this is my way of organizing these words you can do it in your own way share that in the comment sections down below when I think of what a top or a bottom is I think about as a person who's vanilla and or, like moving through the world I think about power exchange okay if I'm at a bank is the person who's the bank teller do they have more power exchange are they kind of the top in this situation and then I think about oh if I'm just hanging out with my siblings like who's more of a toppy sibling who's a bottom sibling well you all got the bottom sibling you know it's not sexual it's about you know kind of like alpha beta but not alpha beta because that stuff's kind of cringe but it's kind of like that so it might sound cringe either way it's kind of like the problem with bubble speak is we all kind of utilize words that are cringy to others, but not to us. So top, bottom, alpha, beta, same difference. At the end of the day, we're sizing each other up. Can you contend with me? How should I treat you? Should I treat you with a warm? Hi, how are you? Oh my gosh, you look fabulous. Should I treat you with a hey bitch? What's going on? Mm, what is this? Should I treat you with a, honestly, bro, how's it going? Like, <laughs> Cody Co. <laughs> like, what energy are we supposed to be vibing off of, right? Tops and bottoms, I think about that in just alpha beta, but I also think about it in BDSM terms. So in BDSM terms, a top or a bottom is a person who, when a scene is happening, when there's power exchange happening, they have the role of being the top and you have the role of being the bottom, let's say. So when I'm with my top at my birthday party, that was a situation where as a switch, I was fighting for power. He came in and said, I'm a top. And I came in and said, I'm a switch. And then he, him and I looked at each other. This is all kind of metaphysical, like nonverbal things happening. This is the meta conversation that's sort of happening silently, which is now that I'm the switch tied up in position of bottom, but could still come out on top like I did with others. Let's see if you, sir, can come in and do that power exchange with me and let's see who comes out on top. I came out on bottom, which as a switch is still a win for me. But for him was a major win because I had... We had had that moment where now we could size each other up and it ended up making every scene we had after that gold. I love scening with him. He's one of my greatest friends. I really adore him. I respect him immensely. And that's what makes, in my opinion, um, a great motivator for me to utilize BDSM as sort of that understanding of self because not only does it allow me to be intimate with people, it allows me to be intimate with myself in a very safe way. So him and I actually have a few scenes we've done together that really – helped me on my journey, right? There was another scene we did, an infamous banana scene. Maybe you guys, some of you recall the details of that scene. Really outrageous scene. But I really wanted to face my fear. And I think fear is the root of all evil. It's not money or greed or anything else, though greed I think is a big part of it. But I think fear, which I think is the foundation for most of our fears. Fear is a great pathway to anger, is a great pathway to greed, is a great pathway to jealousy. Fear of losing someone, fear of not having something, um, the fear of not knowing the self, I think can lead us down a really destructive path. So I think instead of becoming a victim to my fear, I just wanted to overcome it. And I found that using BDSM allowed me to overcome that fear. So we had this scene with this banana because I have a thing around bananas. And like four of my friends showed up and utilized a banana theme within the scene 
to kind of like uh, exposure therapy me <laughs> in a way. And disclaimer, BDSM is not therapy. BDSM is a pastime between adults in which imagination is being used as a form of ritual, expression, or connection. So it is not in any way therapy. You should, guys, you, if you need help, go see a real therapist. I did that. I saw a real therapist for my mental health and used BDSM for my meditative spiritual health. These are different categories. If you're going to be a whole human being, remember that mental health and spiritual health are not the same. They are intertwined. They are definitely connected, but they're not the same, right? Okay, so moving forward, BDSM became this thing for me where people over the years would ask me, are you, are you using BDSM as therapy? And I'd say, no, you really don't want to do that. I used to be a peer educator in BDSM. You really don't want to use BDSM as therapy. You want to use it as a tool to know the self better. But I find a lot of people use it to run away from their responsibilities or a lot of people use it like a drug. Even though my BDSM is done sober, so no weed, no alcohol. Some people do engage. It's pretty uncommon though. Most people in BDSM that I know of do it sober. And so it's kind of one of those things where some bubbles might do it differently. But my areas always did non-alcoholic. And or if there was alcohol, you'd have to wait a certain amount of hours before you could play again. So we try our best to be safe, sane, and consensual. But sometimes we have to use Zubriskaway or Kink to utilize the tools in front of us to explore the self. So even if it looks crazy to somebody else, you have to have a reasoning for why you're doing it so it actually isn't crazy. Does that make sense? Throughout my life, BDSM was always a spectrum for me. Uh, a spectrum of desire, a spectrum of exploration. But when I was a little kid, I knew I wanted to try BDSM. I knew so much that I wanted to try it that I was reading all these fictional books, all these little erotica pages, all these things to try to find how people were doing BDSM. And then finally, I, be, I, you know, came across my mentor, a woman in her 50s, a fabulous woman, a, a dominant, a leather woman, really educated in her normal life, but then also educated within BDSM, somebody who was a leader in our local communities. And she took me on and brought me into the scene and had me read all these books. And I just felt so at home. I felt so at home. And now, three years later, I haven't been to a BDSM dungeon. I haven't seen any of my play partners. Uh, COVID definitely kept us away from each other. And I and I still feel very connected to the idea of BDSM, not the community so much. Like I don't feel like I'm on the forums anymore, or stuck on fet life drama or anything like that. I'm kind of I'm kind of at a different juncture where I've noticed that I'm still interested in utilizing BDSM to know me and to know my partners. And I want to explore the world through that lens, but it doesn't have to be the sole lens. There's a lot uh, a lot of different versions of me internally, and not all of them are BDSM. Actually, if we really want to be honest, you know how I talk about the core parts of the self and I say that I use the number eight, even though it's like an arbitrary number, there's eight parts to the self. There's eight parts of Brittany that are the core parts that are, there's the core, core part, the internal consciousness. Then there's the core parts of what makes up the self's core part. It's, it's a lot, but overall, okay, those parts, you would think one of mine would be BDSM Brittany, but it's actually not. It's not BDSM Britney. It's actually specifically masochistic Britney. So BDSM, Britney, Daddy Simon, masochist, BDSM. The, like m for me, when I'm when I when I'm asked, is BDSM? Are you in BDSM because you have trauma? I think to myself, no, I've really traced back to most of my kinks and most of them come from pretty healthy places, but there were a couple that were the loudest when I was most unhealthy and are now basically dormant now that I'm healthy. But I'll tell you this, masochism for me has always been around in my life. Now, I'm sure when you hear that word, you think a very specific thing, share it in the links or the comment sections down below, because I am curious because when I hear that word, I hear like, I hear like deep breaths. I hear like, you know what you sound like when you're like underwater and just like, it's just like beautiful. I hear, I just, I hear almost nothing, but I hear like water sounds or earth sounds. I feel very in, I feel very clear headed. Half the reasons I jump out of airplanes is literally to feel that adrenaline that I often feel through masochistic scenes. The other day I got a massive bruise, bruise on my leg and my brain was like, Wow, like I'm very impressed with myself because I had saved a cup of coffee in order to not spill this cup of coffee. I had to let my leg take the brunt of the impact. And so I did not spill my coffee and I fucked up my leg. 
but it was kind of badass to have like a scar afterwards. I'm kind of sad the bruise is going away now. This is all BDSM thinking. Like in BDSM, a lot of us do strive to push our, our per, ourselves to our limits and even past to sort of to well, there's two reasons. The shallow reason to be like, oh, I'm such a strong masochist. Look how cool I am. And then the other reason, which I hope hopefully does follow, which is, wow, look how strong I am. Look how um, disciplined I am. Look how in my body I am. Look how good I am at mitigating my pain. Look how good I am at understanding myself and my limitations. There's something about camping out on your own. When I was out in the wilderness by myself and I was traveling solo, there were so many feelings of fear and getting through every night where I didn't pack up and go home to my parents was like a reminder for myself to be like, you can meditate through this. You can remind yourself that you are statistically going to be fine, but also you are going to be fine because you're you. So masochism isn't just like, I'm going to self-harm because self-harm is a punishing act. Self-harm is saying, I'm not worthy and I'm going to cause pain. Masochism is saying, I'm going to, if I am disciplined enough, turn this into a meditation practice, much like the natives do with the hook, you know, the hook, the hook suspensions. Oh my gosh, my brain was losing that word. When the Native Americans do the hook suspensions, they use it as a meditative practice, right? The dancing of the sun. It's like a meditative practice. When I think about that, when I see that, I've seen people use hook suspensions. It feels meditative to me. It feels very much like you're moving past the fear because, you know, when you do things to your body and your body's like this, we should not be doing this. You do want to not do it anymore. You want to stop. But if you go past that in an organized, safe manner, usually, hopefully, after a couple classes, <laughs> which I've taken a lot of classes about needle play and blood play and knife play, like I really recommend you do classes run by people who hopefully are in the medical profession if you're lucky. So when I was doing those things, I felt more grounded in who I was as a consciousness. I felt more focused. Now, other people in BDSM might just use it to have fun, to have sex, to joke around, to be petty, to be... Everyone has their reason. Everyone has a tool they use. I'm not here to pretend like the BDSM community is so perfect. But it, depending on how you practice it, it can definitely be a lot safer than your average vanilla Coachella visit. You know what I mean? Like there is just certain rules implemented in certain bubbles in BDSM that allow for a much safer experience depending on what you want. So for me, I'm all about risk aware kink and safe sane consensual. I want to mix them together. I want to utilize BDSM to know myself better and to know the person that I'm with better. But I especially want us to push each other through intimacy to be the better versions of ourselves, I do want to be stronger. I want to be stronger every day. And a big part of that for me is not just throwing knives at trees, which my brothers and I were trying to go out into the woods and throw knives at trees and practice. It's not just that. And it's not just feeling grounded by doing that. It's about understanding my precision, my strength, and my skill when it comes to my knowing my own limitations as a human form. Right? I'm really kind of obsessed with knowing my limitations as a body. And I think in order to do that, you actually have to do things. So you can't just sit at home all day and just say, oh, I'm going to think about the pain of my life. No, you have to go out there and do something about the pain in your life. And I think BDSM, if done correctly, can be a tool to do that. Okay, so other questions. The difference between men and women are men actually more submissive? Are women actually more top? There's something that's going on in this, this new energy change in the universe where I'm seeing a huge shift of men being much more comfortable in their bodies. The Gen Z boys on my discord, y'all are my favorite, my favorite. They're so comfortable with their bodies and their orientations and their, their everything. They're just so much com more comfortable than older millennial men that I'm used to dealing with because now I'm in my thirties. They're just so different. And I think that's beautiful for them. I don't think it was accessible to millennial men. And I think millennial men are learning now how to be more open, but I think they have a lot to work on, which is very difficult. Millennial women have to deal with a lot as well because now we're facing a responsibility of maybe being the breadwinners and being the tops in relationships, whatever that means. You know how I talk about Jordan Peterson on occasion, Dr. Jordan Peterson, his wife Tammy is actually who I love, but she's a very strong willed woman she's very um combative and she is not agreeable just like me and jordan is an agreeable person i i've look i've looked at jordan peterson i've watched his videos i have a lot of really critical things to say about his work but as a person i think he's pretty aware that he is the bottom in his relationship and i think that's really important to see 
because I think a lot of men look at Jordan Peterson and think he's a top, but his even his own wife, even he knows he's not the top in the relationship. So these traditional masculine run relationships, these patriarchal relationships that have been sort of encouraged over time, at least in the last few gener or up until the last few generations, I think I think even they could take a moment and pause and look at themselves and say, "Am I really a top or a bottom? What does this mean, right?" What does it mean to be in BDSM and have submissive energy and top energy and all these things? Okay, so I think all of these things are happening outside in real life. And then when we come to the dungeon, they get utilized differently. So in BDSM, you have roles and titles that don't reflect your outside world. So if maybe Jordan Peterson and Tammy were tops and bottoms in Vanilla World and in their marriage, which they are, you could say Jordan Peterson is a top in his field, a top energy. And Tammy is a top energy in her field and in her household. And Jordan's more of a bottom energy in his household. That's all correct terminology in my opinion. But that's in their vanilla life. And then if they came to the dungeon, well, maybe it switches. Maybe Tammy's actually a bottom pony and Jordan Peterson's a top daddy dom. I don't know. It's like, okay, well, maybe that switches. So when you're in the dungeon... It switches depending on your desires and needs. There's this uh, saying in the BDSM community that if you're submissive in the dungeon, you're a dominant in real life, in vanilla life. So a lot of the women and men who are often submissives or like really just bottom, bottom identities in BDSM were often people who are put in very like leadership positions in vanilla life. So in my life now, in my, okay, so in my 20s, I was always aggressively the same personality wise in terms of being a top in my job and in my world. But in the dungeon, I was strictly basically a bottom the whole time. And I only came into my switchiness mostly here now in the last like few years because I, I it just fits right with my energy. So the people around me automatically bring out my top energy in every way, in my job, in my flirtatious world and everything. I'm always naturally the top right now. I'm fine with that. It feeds my energy really good. Yes, ideally I'd be able to do both since I switch, but ultimately I'm pretty happy in this because like I said, if the energy, the bottom energy is in front of me, I will naturally just be my toppy self. And BDSM, when I explain that I'm in top energy, for Brittany, that means naturally. So when I'm in a group of all my tops, I naturally go to bottom space. When I'm in a group of all bottoms, if they are my bottoms or bottom to me, I naturally go into top space. And I don't mean like they negotiated, like, can I be a top with you or a bottom? I mean, we are standing next to each other and just naturally they go, um, they like I naturally want to serve. They naturally want to be a bottom. You ever meet somebody and you're just naturally a bottom to them? Girl, I've been in business meetings. I've been in church. I've been at the doctors. Sometimes I'm a top to my doctor. That's what I'm saying. Like sometimes this language gets so hard to, to, to understand because you just don't know what's happening. But I think it's spiritual. I think it's metaphysical. I think it's energy. I think it's, it, it's, it's used and utilized in different bubbles with different words or similar words, top, bottom. When I talk to my gay guy friends and they're like, top, bottom, switch, they're talking about sexual positions. Or sometimes they're talking about BDSM. You know what I'm saying? I really miss BDSM. I miss the energy that is in that dungeon. And I know a lot of dungeons closed down because of COVID. And I know it's really hard to do things because of COVID. But there is nothing like being in a room. Ooh, the candle went out. Sorry, if you see the smoke coming out. Oh my gosh, sorry. High Priestess is our sponsor today and the candle just went out. So let me look. Okay, so there's the crystal in the middle there. Do you guys see it? And then the smoke is all around it. It smells really good. I'm kind of sad the candle went out already, but also I think it hit the crystals and that's probably why it went out. So that's pretty cool. Let's jump back into the BDSM talk. Look, I miss my people. I miss it. I miss being in a room full of thousands of people wearing leather. I miss the sound of boots when they hit the concrete. I miss the sound of just like whips being, you know, I miss all of it. But I also know that a time and a place, it needs to be right. The energy needs to be good. And I know when energy is good again, I'll be back in a dungeon. But I don't need it every day because I can utilize different meditation tools every day in my life. But BDSM in particular is my favorite form of energy exchange and meditation with someone else. It's so good. It's so good just being with someone and not having to talk because you've already all done the paperwork and the negotiation beforehand and just being in a scene where you are where you are genuinely giving over to your energy, just genuinely giving over to their energy, genuinely allowing a safe space to exist enough so you can let go. <sighs> I love it. So the last thing we need to cover 
is how to read vibes. Energy, What? how does one know? That was a great, great debate happening on Discord. How does one feel energy? Well, first and foremost, you guys have been seeing the work I've been doing with Destiny. So, okay, my greatest example of somebody who's completely cut off from their metaphysical spiritual side. So I've interviewed his wife, Melina, which you guys saw. She was much more open, much more in tune with her metaphysical side, her, her energy side. So the, en- the conversation was much easier because we didn't have to like worry about her being blocked but obviously destiny steven is blocked so we want to help him i'm publicly doing this he knows i am like determined to pop his little metaphysical bubble a little bit his little witchy bubble a little bit because i don't need you or him or anyone to believe in this stuff like real real like i don't right i don't believe it's real real but i have i do i do i do think you need to believe in it in just a little bit just like a little bit to really enjoy it. Kind of like drugs. If you fight the DMT, the DMT elves are not going to take you to blast off. You can't fight the drug. You can't fight the metaphysical. You can't fight the energy. Can't fight the unexplained. It's too fun. It's too fun to skip out on. You guys got to explore it. So I want to take someone like Destiny, who's really closed off, and just integrate them into understanding like there's energies, right? Now he knows there are energies. He he calls them um, social interactions. (laughs) I think he would say because like he he does debates for a living. So when he's talking to people, there's an energy that's being exchanged and he can read it and then he can shift it and change it. And so he knows he's doing it, but his he's being too logical. Like it's it's just a social interaction caused by, uh you know, me moving and them talking and us feeding off our facial expressions instead of saying like, oh, hey, I'm really having like a moment with you or hey, we're trying to have a moment or hey, can we guide this energy in a way that's like really working together. I think I use more woo-woo language, more warm language. I think for me, because my core uh, identity is mother, mothers, I think, are the epitome of like not only encompassing warm energy, but I think they are kind of flowy and flowery and fruity and not fixed. I think we are fluid in our language and we're allowed to be. So to some people who are very stringent in their language, like a destiny, it's fine that he's like that. But when he asks, well, what am I missing? And he goes, I have no relationship to energy or witchiness or woo-woo-ness because I think it's all silly. Well, that's what you're missing because I was there too. When I was like a super atheistic nihilist, I was like, fuck all this magic stuff. It's so stupid. And now I'm like, you know what? I don't like it when people tell me it's objective, when it's been a anecdotal subjective experience for them. But I don't mind when they come to me and say, this really worked for me. Because that's how I feel about everything I've done in my life. I look at BDSM and if I look at it in a certain lens, I'm like, oh my God, those are a bunch of 40 and 50 year olds, legit in leather, spanking each other and screaming daddy. So stupid. And then if I look at it in a different way, I'm like, holy crap. Those are people in their 40s and 50s who finally have a chance to dress how they want and, it, and and have a beautiful organic moment with someone they love in a way that looks silly to everyone else, but to them means something. And not only does it mean something to them, but now they have this whole community of people around them who are also similar enough that they understand what they're doing. BDSMers are never confused about what I'm doing, right? Not really. It's usually like non-BDSMers because when I say I don't utilize my sex in BDSM, it's not BDSM people who are like, what do you mean? It's vanilla people. That's the irony. The irony is that BDSM people are not traditionally the ones who don't understand that I don't use sex in BDSM. Because vanilla people think that anything they do that's unorthodox, anything they do that's weird, should only be done if it gives them an orgasm. And I'm saying, no, it can also give you a connection with a person that's special to you. Introspective moments, spiritual moments, meditative practices. It doesn't have to be all about orgasm. Even sex itself, penetrative sex, does not have to be about orgasm. So when you're looking for energies, what you're doing is kind of not like aura reading, but, you know, my aura friends would say your aura reading you're reading sort of the energy of their whole body, their whole context of their humanity. You're thinking about who they are as a person, who they are within this bubble, how they think they're being perceived. And then I go off of like, oh, people feel a certain way. I know I have really warm energy because when I'm in public, strangers come up to me to talk to me. I've had strangers I don't even know. I don't even know, right? Like cry into my arms. And I'm just like, holy shit, it's happening. What I think is happening is an energy uh, acknowledgement. They are looking at my energy. 
They see it. They know I'm safe. Sometimes you just look at someone, you're like, ooh, I think they're going to hurt me. Or I look at someone and I'm like, ooh, I don't like this energy. It's not from trauma either. Trauma informed, being trauma informed, like being informed by your trauma is different than being informed by reading an energy. Oh, this sounds so woo woo. But it, it literally is so different. And one is I call it like my sane brain. And one I call it my mental illness brain. So if I'm having like a mental illness, like am I afraid of this person? That's a different Brittany than the Brittany that's like, ooh, what energy am I feeling from you right now? I'm really getting this from you. So the work I do, my one-on-one calls, my consultation calls, when I do those, I usually tell people like, mm, you're saying this, but mm, your energy is giving me this. And they're like, fuck, how did you see that? And I'm like, because your energy is really screaming it to me right now, which sounds very woo woo, but it works. And that's what I'm saying. It works. Obviously, look at the success rate with my callers. Look at the success rate with my work. It works for the right person. BDSM is the right tool for me, but it might not be the right tool for you. My one-on-one calls where I use like different language that I've created or utilized like bubbles, okay? It might not work for you, but it works for some. So what we're trying to practice is an awareness that not everything is meant for us, and some things are meant for others. So when I see things like, okay, I just introduced Verveki to my sister because I was trying to explain my ideas to my sister and she was like, oh, I don't get it. Like, I don't like this. And I was like, okay, I got it. So then I showed her Verveki and I was like, see how he's a professor. He's an academic. He speaks your language. Listen to him. And I only started listening to Verveki a year ago. So she was like, is this where you got all your ideas for the levels? No, girl. I'm just letting you know there are already people who have discovered what I've discovered because we are all having similar experiences it's not that we're discovering something new in the world we're discovering something new for us in our world so when I created the levels it was because I had discovered something along with my co-author that meant something and help us and help change our world same thing you're just going around life trying to utilize tools that will help you change for the better for the more positive You know, even if it seems hokey or silly, you wouldn't go to a Catholic and say, it's kind of silly what you're doing. Or maybe you would if you're Ricky Gervais or, you know, me. But at the same time, I know why they're doing it. And it doesn't seem so silly. When I'm in mass, it really doesn't seem silly. When I'm with my atheist friends, yeah, we can make fun of them because it seems silly. But truly, if I'm being honest with you, it's because it is and it isn't. I don't think it's wrong to live with these contradictions. I don't think it's wrong that someone is looking at me with my witch box and my BDSM gear and thinking that's so silly because don't worry, boo-boo, I'm looking at you and I'm thinking the same thing. And that's why I try to gay judge people instead of real judge. I try just to say, hmm, that's weird. Okay. Because at the end of the day, it must be a tool that helps them. Now, if you notice yourself doing, like utilizing a tool and never getting anywhere with it, then it's probably not the tool for you and it's probably just something you like to do as a hobby, a pastime or within your life. Let's say someone switches to veganism and ends up like quitting a drug and being like, veganism saved my life. It helped me get off drugs. Maybe, totally, very plausible. But you could also be a person who's on drugs and just eats vegan. That's what life is like to me. Everyone has a different way of fixing their problems. Not everyone utilizes the same tools to fix those problems. You're really supposed to focus on yourself in, in regards to this. You're supposed to be selfish enough to think introspectively about the self and to say, am I being served by this tool, even if everyone's saying that I need it? There was a story um, I was told about a man who had one session of therapy and another man who had zero and both found a way to help their mental illnesses, right? And I think about that, how it's not about you have to do everything the thing You have to do the thing that everyone does. It's about, are you doing the right thing for what you need done? And that's all that freaking matters. Thank you guys for being here. Thank you to High Priestess for sponsoring this video. I really hope you guys have a fantastic day. I hope you enjoyed this podcast. I got to get going because I have calls to do now. And once again, I jump out of this energy. I'm going to change. I'm going to do a little ritual. Let go of this energy that I have for you guys and move into call energy because the next person I'm going to talk to, girl, I know we about to talk. I know we about to talk. Very exciting. Very exciting for this call because again, it's a different exchange of energy. That's why I love doing calls. That's why I can't wait to talk to thousands of you over the next few years. That's why I'm honored that so many people stay for my calls for years, but it's an opportunity to power exchange and or 
energy exchange, depending on the context of the situation. Okay, talk to you guys soon. Bye. Stuck in my head, in real life while I'm dead. My belly's being fed and I'm okay. I'm just fine, yet all I do is whine. Not to you in my mind, cause I know I don't make sense. I've been nothing but blessed. So why's my life a mess? Please tell me, cause I'm sick of thinking. Yeah. Sick of reaching out for the truth